So hello everyone and welcome to another live stream. Uh, today I have a fantastic guest, a good friend of mine. Uh, I spent some time with him in Seattle uh, about a year ago and it was a wonderful time for me because he is such an amazing artist and such a generous teacher. He's worked at Sony for over 16 years, if I'm correct. He's now at Disney. <laughs> Uh, amazing artist, please welcome uh, Mr. Marcelo Vignali. Hello, so. everybody. <laughs> and thank you, Walter, for that, uh, that wonderful introduction. Yeah, so I, I've been at, uh, I, I was at, at uh, Sony for, well, just to give you like just a, a, a backup on the career, um, I worked at Imagineering, uh, working in theme parks, uh, coming up with Toontown and a bunch of different um, attractions I worked on. I think it was four different parks, uh, the one in Japan, the two in the U.S., and the one in Paris. Then I, uh, I left. I worked on Mulan, Brother Bear, Lilo and Stitch, uh, several movies at, at Disney Features. Then I left, and uh, I was working at Sony Pictures for 17 years. And I was there, and uh, I worked on uh, from the, the, just about every film that they worked on. Uh, up until that point, all the way up from uh, open season to uh, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. And then from that, I've been now, I've just celebrated my one-year anniversary. I'm now working at Disney Television uh, in the visual development department, uh, working basically as the, as the art director for visual development. Wow. And, and are you then working on one project or on... on multiple projects oh, no multiple projects all at once as they come in and then we we make assessments over the over those projects and okay how we yeah. wow and so 17 years at one company i think that's that's pretty unique in this industry uh, i think i broke a record <laughs> i think so too you should get a medal or something, <laughs> something <right. laughs> but is did you uh did the uh, industry change over that time? Oh my gosh, you know, it's funny because, yeah, from the very beginning, I started in animation in 1987. Uh, and, but here's the thing, we got, we got to back up. Uh, and the, when I first, uh, when I was a kid, I, I was four years old, and I, I saw the, uh, it was Fantasia, and it just, and it blew my mind. I saw that and I thought, whatever this magic is, whatever, because I, at one point I was terrified, I was hiding, hiding behind the seats because I didn't want to see the demon. Uh, and then other, other parts of the film, you know, like when the leaves were coming down off the trees or the frost was growing on the lake, when those things were happening, I remember just being so mesmerized by that. And, and even the, the dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs came out, I thought they were real. That was my Jurassic Park moment. You know, you're four years old, you see something like that for the first time, you have no idea what you're looking at. Uh, so then I, I started to, just whatever, you know, Disney films would come up, or there was a show called The Wonderful World of Disney. Whenever those things would come up, it was always just glued to the television. I wanted to learn, what are they doing? How are they doing it? And I love to draw during this whole point. It's just you know, something that my brother and I were always doing. The from that to all the way to get to art school I had in mind that I was going to you know, go into animation but unfortunately the animation industry was dead you know Hanna-Barbera had stopped making most of their films uh, Warner Brothers had, had completely disbanded their animation department uh, UPA was already gone Filmation was just about to go under and Disney was in the process of being sold and carted up they were going to be selling the animation department separate from the rest of the company this is right before Eisner came on for it. So everybody, when I went to art school, everybody, all my art teachers were telling me, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Wow. But despite that, I kept drawing in sort of an animation style. I just loved animation. I had to work in the industry. So I thought, well, yeah, I was going to go into illustration, and that my illustration style would be to draw in this sort of animation look. And, that was, and I figured that was going to be my thing. And it's funny because that in, I finished art school in uh, 1987, and I had this portfolio with all this animation work in it. And fortunately for me, there was a studio that was hiring. Uh, it was an animation studio. It was Deke, and they had this different plan. 
uh, for animation, which was because it was the expense that was killing them. So because they, they, uh, the animation was so expensive to make, they couldn't make it anymore. But Deke found a way to make that happen, which was to take the the designs, have them be done here so they have American sensibilities, and then farm the production aspects out to, uh, to Asia. And I think it was Japan and Korea were the two studios, or, or the, the places where the studios were in Asia. So we were sending the work over there, and I, I got hired and, uh, to do design work for them. Uh, and uh, you can imagine I opened up my portfolio, and it, and it looked like an animation portfolio. I had a very animated looking things, lots of drawings, lots of paintings with characters and things like that. And that's what was the, you know, what sort of opened the door for me. And, and here's the interesting thing, was in 1987, I got myself hired at the animation studio. In 1988, Roger Rabbit comes out, and in 1999, Little Mermaid comes out, and then suddenly there's there's this huge explosion in animation, and there's this huge interest in animation, and we've been riding that wave. I mean, it's, it went through its all its transition and everything, but we've been riding this wave of enthusiasm for animation. And had I not stuck to my guns and believed in mm. working in animation and believed that it had value that I wouldn't have been ready for that moment. But wow. I was determined to work in animation, even if there was no industry. Yes. And it just so happened that I had the right portfolio at the right time when when it needed to happen. So I, I think that it really is a testament to stick to your guns. If you believe in something and you see something in your head, this is the, the reality you want to create create it and you'll see that a lot of times the opportunities they they present themselves for you yeah that's what they say right uh, uh preparation and, and opportunity that's that's where success uh, happens right so you, yeah. you were preparing all this time not even sure about what the opportunity was going to be but because you were ready when the opportunity came you were the man Yeah, yeah, and, and it's funny because some people liken it to jumping out of an airplane without a parachute, hoping that on your way down, you find the parachute, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's kind of like that. You just have to have faith that it's, I'm jumping out in, in faith, and I have this expectation that, that this is going to be there for me when I when I jump. Uh, the um, Also, Arnold Schwarzenegger made a, a fascinating, uh, I guess he was doing a, a commencement address or something like that to a college uh, and he said that the life really is about luck and it really is it's a luck and timing but it's so much of it depends on luck but the harder you work the luckier you get <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great and, and it's true i mean when you think about that it really does break down to that that it is luck but if it wasn't let's say that uh, that opportunity didn't didn't present itself And there was no animation boom uh, during that point. Does that mean that between now, uh, between then and now, there wouldn't have been? Mm. I, I don't think so. I think it would have yeah. happened anyway. Or, or that uh, I had already prepared myself to work in illustration, but doing this very sort of animation sort of look. So I think that despite w wherever these things would have happened, I would have landed on my feet. Hmm. And, and I think that young people need to know that. I, I think that was one of the things I, I struggled with most when I was younger. And part of that was because I didn't have an, an art background. My, my mother uh, worked, uh, she worked in factories. My dad was a bricklayer. Um, and so there really wasn't any, um, I didn't have an uncle or somebody that, that I could talk to about art. So a lot of that, when I was just kind of having to make up as I went along, just trying to figure out like, okay, well, now, now what do I do? And, and I think that, that when I look back, uh, I, I think that it was, it was important for me to just have the faith that if you build something that is, that is competent and you work hard at it, that doors are going to open for you. But and I, I, when I was teaching, I was teaching in, in Utah, and I would tell my students that there's work for everybody. You know, a, anybody that gets into art, there's going to be work for you. You don't have to worry about that, but, but there's one condition. You have to be good. You have to be really good. If you're really good, your phone won't stop ringing. 
and, and I tell them that, that depends on you. It's mm -hmm. you're you're the one that makes that decision. How hard you want to work, how good do you want to get? Yeah. And that and that makes the difference whether your phone rings or it doesn't ring. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny when you say jumping out of a, an airplane without a parachute, because that's in a way what it felt like when I went to art school. Uh, but I didn't. It didn't really feel like. Uh, jumping out of an airplane for me I, I just needed to jump anyway and later on I realized oh wait a minute it's an airplane I just jumped out of and that's when I started to realize uh, but I just needed to draw period and I wasn't even aware of what I was getting into until later yeah yeah isn't that something like yeah I had I was so naive about the arts and I wanted to be a famous artist. That's what it was. I, I wanted to be, and and the only other artists that I knew at the time were Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. And, oh, and, and Picasso. I knew that I didn't want to be Picasso, but I but I wanted to be Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. And those were, and, and that was it. That was my my sort of naive understanding of art. And then at a certain point, I started to find uh, different fantasy illustrators that uh, that I really enjoyed. Artwork like um, uh, Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta's work was just brilliant. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, then there was the uh, there were different magazines. I think Creepy Magazine had a bunch of illustrators in that, and that's where I found uh, Bernie Wrightson. Mm. Bernie Wrightson's work. So there, there are different people that uh, that I ended up coming across that I thought like, wow, this is this is interesting. How do I do this? You know, how do I find yeah, out yeah. more about this? Yeah, but but again, yeah, like you, I mean, you, uh, you know, when you're starting out, there's this naivete that you have, and you know, if you don't have somebody that can sort of guide you or somebody that can give you some sort of, you know, direction or some explanation of some of these things, then you know, you you run around. I, I guess it's not so bad because you run around having to sample all these things for yourself and make assessments for all these things. There's a lot of things you don't understand, hmm. and you want to understand the like. What is this? Why? Why does? Why does this work that particular way? Yeah. And did you ever experience where uh, the distinguish between high art, high art, and low art, where they said you you want to do animation that's not considered real art or anything? Did Did you experience something oh, like that? Oh. Well, that was it. When I was going to art school, it was I guess. My teachers realized that I had a lot of talent. I had a lot of raw talent. That I, I could draw things, and they, they were very good. But one of the things that really frustrated them was that I was that I was unwilling to sort of change my focus. That I, I really liked this sort of humor in my work, or an appeal, or a whimsy. Those were the things I wanted to go for. And they didn't want that, and and I think that there's a bit of a uh, a snobbery, but, you know, some, something happened, uh, you know, a while back, and um, let's let's say in the 1880s, the 1880s is like when you end up learning about art history, that there was this school of art that if that art had to be representational, and ha and you had to paint these uh, Greek allegories in order for it to have any value, and you know, the artist rebelled against that and said, no, art should be about communication. And so they fought that. And, and I think that was a really good fight. And that's when you had guys like Cezanne and Van Gogh and Monet, all these brilliant, brilliant, like Picasso and Brock and all of these people, Marcel Duchamp, came all out of that. And, and they had things to say. And then the, there was sort of a, a I guess, a, a boondoggle that took place. Uh, in that process, and, and the only thing I can liken it to is that the first, uh, at first, art art can be controversial, and that's a good thing. But then it's funny because the controversy itself became the art. Yeah. And when that happened, then the art was no longer relevant to that process, and yeah. all you end up with is the controversy. And that's where we have things like performance art. There, there's not even a craft that is even associated. I know, with. yeah. And and so um, and so there was this disassociation. So sometimes, like you could see the painting, and the painting was 
was really poor. You know, you could see that even for an abstract, the composition was poor, the color coordination was, was uh, the harmony was poor, but it didn't matter because the, the subject that, that was painted was the statement, or the artist was making a particular statement, and then so the controversy over, was overriding the craft. Well, that's the school that, when I, when I was going to art school, those were my teachers, and the craft was seen as something like, as soon as you attach any level of craft to this controversy, you're, you're diminishing that process. Mm -hmm. You're diminishing the value of, of the controversy. And, um, and so, yes, just, to my surprise, like I said, I was completely naive in this process. I didn't understand that this, there was this whole battle and this history that was happening for like 100 mm -hmm. years by the time I got to art school. And I couldn't understand for the life of me why the teachers were so adamant and why they were so mm -hmm. hostile to yeah. my drawing things that were representational. My, my just, well, I just want to learn how to draw. You know, <laughs> I want to learn how to draw a person. I, wanna, I, I came here so that you could teach me. And, uh, and, and I wasn't getting that. And uh, the, like I said, and the teachers were hostile. They were hostile to me. We went to the same art school, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you back there? Oh. Well, I, you know, I, I, I am, I, I'm younger than you, and and uh, and I still hear these stories from people who are younger than me, even. So, some things still have to change, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think that it's unfortunate because there, there seems to be a a type of teacher. That that uses this this aspect of uh, of art to hide behind, and mm -hmm. that they don't have to better their craft. They they just have to exist in this uh, you know ethereal world of uh, of controversy and statement, and never have to work on the craft. Uh, and but a lot of times, uh, you know, students. I, I think that art schools should be more focused on the craft because you're going to have a lifetime of opportunity to find things to say. And when you're really young, you don't have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of experience. You, don't, you haven't suffered a lot of tragedy. And, and so the best thing to do is to learn how to say these things, how, how to speak. I, yeah. I really do think art being a visual vocabulary and you learn to draw, and when you draw these things, it speaks to your audience. You can learn how to draw something that evokes compassion in people. It speaks. It speaks just as much as a song, or just as much as a poem, or just as much as the written word when you draw these things. And, when, and nobody, would, nobody would question whether or not, it, let's say, like children are going to school, and what do we do? We teach them the ABCs. They, yeah. they first they learn how to how to write the alphabet, and then they start forming words together, and then they start learning sentence structure. All of these things so that they can learn to speak, to say things. Well, artists need to do the same thing. Artists need to find a way to learn how to speak with their craft, learn how to draw, learn how to paint, learn how to do composition, learn how to create space and depth, learn how to create something that's flat, and when to use it, when not to use it. All of those things are, are tools to communicate effectively, to speak. So why wouldn't schools teach that necessary art grammar that allows us mm. to find, uh, you know, to, to be able to speak when we have something to say? So yeah. we do have somebody, artists, that yeah. grows older. Well, to, they, to, me, they, have... to me, they they said that that would interfere with my sincerity as, a, as an artist they didn't want to meddle in that and i always thought they they didn't take me seriously as an artist if they think that teaching me how to draw perspective or, or how to do life drawing that that would have a bad effect on how i would express myself you know if i you know if i'm a if, if i were to be a, a great artist then that shouldn't hold me from becoming a, a better artist. You know, I, I can make my own decision when I want to use depth in my painting or not. Uh, teaching me how to create depth only helps me to make a better decision why I want to use it instead of 
being unaware of the fact that it even exists. So Isn't that uh, I, it's sort of like, it, it would, would they say the same thing with grammar? So you know, <laughs> they're, they're going to say, ah, we don't want to teach you grammar. We don't want to teach you how to spell because we think that it's going to interfere with your poetry. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? No one would say such a foolish thing. Exactly. But for some reason, this this mindset exists in the arts and in, in the art schools. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that a lot of teachers are hiding uh, their uh, their ineptitude uh, with uh, uh, under the guise of, of this. You know, like mm. they're open yeah. either it's the artistic purity or uh, the controversial aspects of art, and they're hiding here. And they're not passing that information. And they can't pass that information mm. along because they don't know it. Yes, that's true. I think this is a great time because the internet shows people what else is there. And, and because I've seen so many uh, students uh, struggle with this because they have even they have something to say, but they they are unable to put it on the paper because they no no one teaches them how to do this and now suddenly you see all these people online and and you have so much more access to art than than back in the day uh, but also to online education and and now a lot of online schools they offer techniques because people they need techniques besides having something to say i think that yeah. it's really great about this time because the people who want to learn now also have the uh, access to to that information. Yeah, they don't know, uh, or that's the one thing they're not getting. So, like, if you went to art school and and you didn't learn these basic techniques, then you, you can do that. You can sign up for a school, let's say, like Schoolism with Bobby Chu, and there it is. You've got a teacher, an instructor that can teach you that. And here's the interesting thing: that uh, all throughout the ages, that if you want to do a particular type of art that you had to, I guess, be in the town where the person was doing this type of art, this sculpture or painting or something. And so you had all of these places, like the one place was known in Italy for their doing frescoes. Another place was known for doing the sculpture. Another, another place altogether was known for doing castings and bronze and things like that. And there was no, there was no way that any of it was connected and then along come the, uh, the Medici family, and they got behind Michelangelo. So here they have this guy, this young student, who's absolutely amazing, amazing talent. They thought, well, let's, let's give this guy, and this was sort of like the birth of, of art education, let's give this guy an education and see what, what happens. So they sent them to these places, and they sent them to these, to these people to train them there. And, and that's where you have the sort of the, the birth, the modern birth of uh, art education. Uh, and and think about that. That they had to actually get Michelangelo on a horse or a cart or something, and then take him to those places, take him to go study and, and learn how to do uh, different parts of the world to learn how to do a particular craft. And how easy it is today that for students, when you think like, oh gosh, you know, the old days, you know, like it was so much easier. No, it's never been easier than today. Mm. And I'll I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, give an example of myself in just a minute. But but here you have Michelangelo. He would go to these places and learn these skills. And and every person today, with actually looking at us on a computer screen, has that same same opportunity to go today, right now, to all those places and study those things and study those techniques and sign up for classes to learn some of these things. All of these things, uh, you know, the books, etc. All of that is at our fingertips today, and the uh, uh, generations of old didn't have it. Even for myself, when I was going to art school, I couldn't see what somebody was doing in Japan unless that book made it to the bookstore. Yeah. I couldn't see what somebody was doing in, in Europe. There, there was a place, I remember at one point, it was a really big deal. There was a bookstore called La Cité, and it was in downtown. And it was the only place in Los Angeles that had French comics. And so oh, like, okay. You know, wow. Yeah, a whole bunch of us would pile into a car <laughs> and drive to Lassie <laughs> Bay, and we would pick up these books in in this bookstore that had French comics. But it, that was the thing is, it, you could only see it that way. Today, any French comic that I want, I go on, I go on Amazon, I find it, I can buy it, and 
And so just think about that, how, how much easier it is today. You want to learn something, it's there. It's there for you to just, to just Absolutely. pick Absolutely, yeah. And, but it takes, uh, you know, it takes effort to, to put into it in order to learn because just, you know, I think it can be uh, overwhelming also because everything is here now available all the time. So you have to create some kind of path for yourself where you uh, can study in, in a certain order so that you don't get overwhelmed of everything that's there all the time. Uh, I hear that a lot from people who see so many great artists online that they, you know, they, they get depressed because of it. Um, and I think it, it's important to, to uh, you know, if you have a, a someone to, to, you know, like a teacher, that's always a good thing, I think, to, to help you lead the way so you know which steps to take first because you can never do everything at the same time. Like, a, like you mentioned with a, a kid learning how to speak, they're not going to... Uh, sing and do poetry and uh, and and rap and 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 write books at the same time. They start with their ABCs, and I think with drawing it's the same thing. You have to you know start with with simple techniques and and gradually uh, expand them. And I remember yeah. uh, you mentioned uh, uh, some time ago that you uh, also uh, created the whole world as your classroom when you wanted to oh. study you, you yeah. remember yeah I, yeah and that was it I, I remember when when I was I, I wanted to get really good at drawing I wanted to get good at drawing and painting and I went to art school and it was really this dissatisfactory I thought my art education actually was very poor when when I got into the, and I, was, and I especially noticed it when I got into uh, at, at Deek, and then we had to draw things in perspective and draw and do construction drawings, and all of these things, I, I just had sort of a, a very vague understanding of, and I learned so much. I mean, I drew so much uh, when we were, and it was a, what they call a sweatshop in animation. So you would go there and you'd be working like 12 hour days, and I, I remember drawing for 12 hours and my hand was so sore that I, I would rub sports cream on it and then I would put a sock over <laughs> my hand and go to sleep because my hand was completely cramped up from drawing <laughs> and uh, uh, and so I would get up pull the sock off take a shower and go to work the next day but but you know that was the way I was dealing with it so I was drawing like 12, 12 hours straight but but during that time the the amount of learning that I was doing, the amount of growing that I was doing, was was really tremendous. But I had to think about that. I thought I, I, I was focused on. I have this goal, and the goal is to be a better artist. And I was going to the drawing classes. <clears throat> I was doing my work, but I wasn't seeing the results that I that I wanted to see. I, I wanted I wanted to see more. I wanted to to grow more. I wanted to be better at, at what I. What I could do, and and that's when I realized that I wasn't going to get to my goal. I wasn't going to be able to make it unless I was in class all the time, unless I was at school, you know, every minute of the day. And I thought, well, that's it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to turn my world into the classroom. And so I started. I, I keep a sketchbook uh, to this day. And I have them stashed in different places. There's a sketchbook by my bed. There's my idea sketchbook. There's my my technique sketchbook where I try different things. Then there's my character sketchbooks and my traveling sketchbooks and then my plein air sketchbooks. And so I, I started just you know stashing all of these books at every at every moment. Even in my car, I, I kept a sketchbook inside uh, you know, right by my car so if I ever went somewhere I went to go get a haircut or something and I knew that I was going to be waiting 15 minutes that's it I and it was a, a little plastic I still have it in the car it's a little plastic box so that the markers wouldn't dry out and inside I had uh, markers and I had a small sketchbook and just grab the little box and go in sometimes the barbers just said hey come on in just jump right in the chair and that's it and I'm not waiting but it didn't matter I was always ready, and I always had my my little 
a sketchbook with me so at any moment, at any moment, I was always prepared to draw. And that's it. So I, I think that you know, for a lot of uh, young people out there, that I, you know, you want to get good. There isn't a whole lot of time in this world, you know, that, and, and you think um, uh, that it's a very, what we're doing is very complicated. And so in order to get good at it and to be proficient at a lot of different things, you, you have to be doing this all the time. You have to make the world, turn the entire world into a classroom. And, and the best way to do that is, you know, to, to uh, uh, filter all of that through your sketchbooks and then break them up into different categories if that helps. But, but never give yourself an excuse not to be drawing. Mm. You're gonna, I went on my honeymoon. <laughs> I broke up my sketchbook <laughs> and I broke my watercolors. <laughs> so uh, and you, you also uh, had this uh, sketch club uh, when you were uh, still working at Sony. Did you, do you still do that now? You know what? I, I, I loved my sketch club. It was really fantastic. But one of the benefits that or or why it worked so well when I was at Sony is I, I could walk out of Sony and we were in that little sort of uh, center. Uh, it was like a, there was a big plaza that, that uh, they had and that was just part of the city and there was sort of a restaurant row. So wherever you went in that area, there's always a lot of people to draw. Right now where I am at Disney, it's sort of an, a nondescript building that is kind of like, a, uh, and there's like factories all around. Mm. And, and that, you know, it goes back to, uh, I guess, you know, it, there, there's no real uh, like center area or plaza or, or area where people get together. And I have to get into my car and drive there. Okay. But, but that sort of thing makes it a little difficult. And I've, I've done that. I've, I've gone out a couple times with friends. Oh, and the other part is there is a plaza and there is a bunch of groups of people that get together. But it's only internal, and I've gone out okay. with some friends, and only, but these are only Disney people that are able to do that, and that's why I can't send out the invite. So okay, yeah. have to figure something out because you know, or, or maybe just do it on the weekends at the day where we we set out on the weekends to, to get together and draw. But uh, but unfortunately, yeah, the uh, Sony worked out really well for that. Yeah, just because of the location, but I, I couldn't. I haven't been able to get that off the ground with any regularity at, at Disney. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I was curious. Could you, uh, when we were in in Seattle, you you did a lecture where you spoke about the fractal method, and uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's it's really uh, your 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 method of uh, translating observation into you know uh, using observational drawing. Uh, but you have this uh, specific technique to do that. Could you could you talk a little yeah. about? Well, one of the things that I found that was frustrating was that you can get a picture in front of you and you can draw it, and you can make a fantastic drawing out of it. But if I ask you to draw that without the photograph, then suddenly it doesn't work as well. And and, and especially when I was up, up and coming in in my uh, development, but that's what I found was frustrating. Why is it that I can draw really well when things are in front of me, and then when I have to draw them from my head, I, I couldn't figure some of these things out. I thought, I, I need to find a way to be able to do that. And I remember trying to lay out backgrounds when I was working at Disney, and it was very, and it was hard, and it was complicated, and, uh, and I, I would do these uh, I would work out my, my little thumbnails uh, and and they would turn into like little tiny, very tight mini drawings of, of what it was I was drawing. And still, like, I couldn't work a lot of these things out. And, and so I needed a system. I needed a system that would help me be a better designer, that would help me lay things out better. And I thought about it. I thought, well, Animators have a system of drawing, so maybe I'll use that system. And I, I started drawing like an like an animator. So they they would draw with a lot of uh, a lot of lines, a lot of you know, like when you look at the animation drawings, they, there's a whole bunch of squiggles, and there's like a big energy line that goes in the center, and then you put all the other squiggles around it, and it covers up that energy line, and you can't see it anymore, and the gesture's lost, and 
and I could, and I'm, I'm looking at this on my, I, okay, you know what, this isn't, this isn't, I can't take that and then translate that into a background. It just doesn't work well for that. So then I thought, like, well, let me, let me go ahead and study the, the anatomy. When the anatomists had their way of drawing, it was with these volumes and construction. And, um, but one of the things that a lot of anatomy drawings have is that they, they lose their sense of gesture. They lose their sense of life. And when you look at them, a lot of times, despite sometimes being rendered really well, they look stiff. And, and you're like, wow, it's funny that a drawing of a little mermaid can look like it has more life than an anatomical drawing. And so I, you know, I, I tried to mix those two together. And then I ended up experimenting with the, uh, the drawing the way the painters draw. And the way painters draw, and this is the, the way that they were teaching us at art school. Uh, which is you just sort of block things in, and then you render the values, and then that's that's how you you get your uh, your figure. So you block things in with these with you know rectilinear lines and measurements, and you measure, and then just you know um, darker shapes recede, lighter shapes come forward, and then and then you spend all this time rendering to try and get that to work, and and that had its effectiveness, but again didn't translate into my work. So I'm thinking, okay, I work primarily as a character designer and background designer. How is it, uh, and, and I thought, like, well, where's the designer's approach to drawing? Where is that? And I realized it doesn't exist. These other disciplines have a way of drawing, and, and it works. And in animations, uh, uh, an animator's approach to drawing is effective because it works. That is their system of training. If you're gonna be a painter, and you, it, there is that system, the painting system. You block everything. Sargent did exactly that. You block things in, and then you render those values, and then you you can make something work. Yep. That's their an effective system to work. If you're going to be an anatomist, and you you want to do the construction and the muscles and put all that stuff together, there's a system, and it works, and it's effective. But if you want to be a designer, where is the designer's approach to uh, to teaching design and training and design and it didn't exist and so that's where the fractal method came in I tried to devise a system that utilized principles from some of these other disciplines and put it all together in a way that uh, that could help me uh, train not only when I'm drawing the figure when I'm drawing my, my um, observational sketches uh, that I, I could take that information break it down into simple ways so that I could uh, the, the very next day, when I'm working at my, you know, my desk and I'm laying out a, a restaurant drawing, or I'm laying out a layout for Mulan, that I could take information that that I had gained uh, in observational studies and then put it in my my drawings, and and that's the uh, that was like the impetus for the for the fractal method, and the fractal method to get into more specifics is that it's a mix of, uh, of these different plans. So you have the, uh, the big shape structure that the uh, painting system has. And then it has the, and so that, that's what you're doing. You're, you're looking, you're, you're creating a big shape. And I call it the fractal method for a reason. You create a big shape, and then from that shape, you fractalize that, and you create smaller shapes. But then there's the other part, which I don't think that some of the other, like the painting systems I'll have, is finding the rhythm in between that, finding the movement in between those uh, individual shapes, and, uh, and then fract uh, continuing to fractalize something into shapes. And any part, at, at any point, you can stop that fractal process, and you end up with a particular look. Like if you start at the, the initial fractal process, it's an abstract. It's a two-dimensional abstract. But you keep fractalizing it, and then you can get the stylization. Then you keep fractalizing that, and you can all the way down to realism. And um, and I, I just think it's a really effective system. Uh, and and especially if you want to be a designer, if you want to be a designer, it, I think it's important to train like a designer. Yeah, and and it it's really effective and also really fast. I, I I've seen uh, live drawings that you did that because of that system. They have a, a, a quite a finished look, but they were done really fast, only a couple of minutes, uh, and that's because you make decisions so uh, so clear 
from the very beginning, it's it's almost like uh, when you uh, look at an image in in low resolution. That's you know that little yeah. shape you see. That's that's the only thing you draw when you see other people start drawing the head and and the eyes and 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 all the details. But you you kind of block things in really simply, and then step by step you you move to uh, a, a more refined process but sometimes you don't even need all those details anymore because the things are in the right place and you just need those elements that are essential for for that look yeah the, it, it's funny that the a lot of times people when they're drawing when they're drawing the figure and we you know all of us are sitting drawing the figure that they're drawing this uh, very much this way where you do a lot of shapes. You know, there's the head, and then it's an oval, and then you're drawing the torso, and it's another oval, and you, or, or you're starting with that gesture line, and then there's this all this building of all the, these shapes, and all of those shapes you're going to cover it up. You know, you're going to cover it up with your uh, structure, you're going to cover it up with your uh, anatomy, and the final rendering. All of that gets covered up. And so while they're doing that, I'm blocking things out. And then uh, once they block it out and I start figuring out my rhythm and I start to make, uh, create my fractals, I start looking for the fractal design inside the, 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 the statement. And it's easier to spot when I'm, when I'm thinking of big shapes and I'm looking for that fractal design. Where, where, does, where does the design repeat itself? And those are the things that I'm looking for. So I start blocking them in. So within the first minute, they're, they're actually ahead of me. They've actually put more marks on the paper their, their drawing looks more like a person than mine. By the second minute, my drawings already look finished and they're still struggling. It's something more or less the same as where they were in one minute. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it really is a, an effective tool to help you uh, organize your thoughts. And that's essentially what you're doing. You're looking at something and you're organizing your thoughts as you're blocking everything in. And then when, when you're coming in with your drawing, the final drawing that come in there, uh, and, and I like to talk about it being the opposite, whereas in, in traditional figure drawing, you start with your gesture, and then you put all these things on top of it and lose your gesture. Versus when you're drawing with the fractal method, you start with the design, and then the last thing that you're putting on is the gesture. So you never cover that up. And so when you look at it, it looks like an amazing, like, look, there's a drawing that has all this rhythm. And it feels, uh, you know, uh, alive, and um, and that's where I was able to to bring that uh, that life that animation has in an animation drawing, and preserve that mm. in in something that looks like a figure drawing. Yeah, because it's the, it's the last thing you put it on top, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never cover it up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Let's yeah, see. And one of the things I I work with is I, I work with a uh, with a pen. You know, so it, it's a marker, uh, and it's a, a dry marker, but nonetheless, it's a marker. So you cannot make mistakes. You cannot go back, and and that's also another effective thing to train with because it forces you to make decisions. You know, years ago, I was work. I was a young man, and I, you know, gosh, this guy was being so nice to me. Uh, his name was Dan Guze, this unbelievable, tremendous artist. And he was, and so here we were in the drawing class, and I was drawing figures, and I was still drawing in this animation style. And I was drawing with all these little shapes and you know, a lot of nervous energy and whatever. And so he, he came by and he looked at my drawing, and he put it on himself. He was so tactful in how he did it. And he said that, you know, uh, but he was actually talking to me. And he said, years ago, a teacher told me that my drawings look like a thousand indecisions. Make a decision, and if it's wrong, fix it. But make a decision, and, yes. and it was a huge revelation. He was so polite in, in, in telling oh, wow. me this, actually putting it on himself. But he was right. I looked at my drawing, and there it was, one thousand indecisions. And that's what every line that I was putting on that paper was an indecision. Hmm. And it was amazing how correct he was because I started making decisions instead of just. This is kind of where the head's going to be. It's kind of where the torso is going to be. And then there's like this big gesture and then this movement. And I, I didn't need to do those things. I could make a decision. This is the angle. Yeah. 
from from the shoulder. I can drop the shoulder all the way down to the knee, and I can line that up, and the foot comes out from that. And I can follow that as I as I'm moving, and I can make that decision. So make a decision. If you're wrong, you can fix the decision, but you've made a decision. But when you make a thousand indecisions, which indecision do you correct? Yeah. And, and it was a tremendous revelation for me. And from then on, that really started to push my idea that my brain had the capacity to make a decision and uh, to look at something, identify it, and make a decision. If it was wrong, and sometimes it is, you correct it. Hey, even when you uh, use the, the dry marker that you mentioned, when you just mentioned you, you use the pen where you can make no mistakes. Yeah. Well, and the, the mistakes, because I'm, when I'm laying it out, so it's very light, I'm laying it in. That's where I'm laying, I'm making you know, all my decisions at that point. By the time that I turn the pen, I start to bite down on the ink, and now I'm getting a direct line of ink. At this point, I've already made all my decisions. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'm not, I'm not going to make a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, can, I mean, I can, the pen could slip out of my hand or something, or some, some you know, thing could happen like that. But in terms of the decision making, it's already been made, and it was made at a really light level. Yeah. So when people look at the drawings, they're like, "Oh my gosh, you never make any mistakes." <laughs> yeah, because if you look carefully, you can see where I moved the line. But it was the line in the under drawing as I was laying out my basic shape in order to make the statement that I wanted to make. Yeah. And yeah. at that point, it was easier to make the adjustment than it was. You know, you draw an arm and like, oh gosh, no, and then you erase it, and then you have to redraw it again. You know that it, that's not happening. Hmm. Yeah, I, I remember you did a, a a book about the fractal method. I can imagine people listening to this are interested. Is that still available somewhere? You know, it 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 is available. Um, but uh, right now they're sold out, and uh, because we're in quarantine, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to get out to Stuart King and drop uh, books off over yeah. there. But uh, but after all of this sort of lifts, I imagine I'm going to be making a trip down there and, okay. uh, and drop some books off for him. Okay, but, good. Um, that's good to know. But yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah, where I they'll be. With, I, I came up with two books. Um, I, I don't I don't have any here readily available with the. Um, uh, and, and they're pamphlet style books, um, but they have a tremendous amount of information. But the goal of this was, because I thought I, I could put a big book together, but one of the problems was when I go to a drawing class, I, I don't bring my Andrew Loomis book. You know, I, I don't bring my uh, Stephen Rogers Peck or my Elliot Goldfinger book. I don't bring those things. Usually what I do is I'll make a photocopy of something. And then I pin, I grab a clip and pin that up on my board. And I realized that's what I use. And this book, booklet is perfect for that. You can turn the page, you can pin it up on your board, and you can follow the directions. Because I, I try to make it as simple as possible. Step one, step two, step three, step four. And you just go through that process. You're like, okay, if I lay this out, I do this, turn the page, I do, and then I lay this out. Then it becomes automatic, and you'll already have that information in your head. But to go through these steps, to you know, to have, uh, you know, for a, a young artist, an artist that's just starting out, to be able to go through methodically through these steps. Now, I'm I'm very much, uh, you know, I know in like the art schools are very against that sort of thinking, right? And they're no, 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 no. There's every drawing has to be, the, you know, you know, just drawn from your gut, and and, and, it's like, and I and, and there is there is truth to that 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 there has to be that that level of sincerity and honesty. But there also has to be a system by which you're making evaluations, by a system by which you're making um, uh, decisions. And that's what this is. The, the fractal method is a system by which it, it puts you in the driver's seat. Every artist has a proclivity to and, and a sensitivity to certain shapes. Every art, artist uh, is unique in that way. So. If you're, uh, if you're an artist, it, you know it's not going to be that they, oh you're going to draw in a way that Vignali draws. Um, and uh, the Bern Hogarth book had that. If if you had the Bern Hogarth Hogarth book, that and you, you know followed it, you would draw like Bern Hogarth. That was just <laughs> it, that's just the yeah. way it was. Yeah. This one isn't because it's a blank slate. It it says 
this is this is how an artist can organize their thoughts in drawing the figure. But you decide what that's going to look like. You make those decisions. You yeah. decide what shapes you find appealing. What uh, what the fractal is going to be. Yeah. Uh, every artist. It's an interesting thing, but every artist has a uh, already has an innate ability inside of them to see shapes and see the world in a particular way. And this allows you to utilize that and identify this is how you think. This is how your brain uh, breaks the shapes down. And to take that and to apply that to, uh, mm. to your work. Um, it was funny. You, you know Marcos Mateo, right? Mm -hmm. did, uh, did you ever get a chance to meet him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's amazing, 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 fantastic artist. Yes. I remember one time we were uh, we were driving downtown Hollywood, and it was late at night. And uh, as we're as we're driving, and then suddenly Marcos goes, "Oh my gosh!" And I'm like, "What?" And and I look, and he goes, "Look at that guy!" And uh, the bus stops here are illuminated, so they have a poster, and it's illuminated, and then this indigo blue uh, poster. Uh, and, and I guess maybe it was underwater, I don't know what it was, it was just a blue poster. But there was a gentleman in front of it, and he was, and I guess he was uh, an older uh, gentleman, and he had like a little suit and a little fedora, and he was completely backlit from the sign, and he was waiting for the bus, oh, and he was smoking too, so he had a cigarette <laughs> in his cup, and he was leaning out to look to see if the bus was coming. But when you looked at it, he was a beautiful silhouette. <laughs> oh, you could tell that he was an older man. It was amazing. And with the little cigarette and everything. And I thought, that's fascinating because that looked exactly like something Martin would Like he draw. would draw it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the thing is, his antenna are already up hmm. to see the world the yes. way he wants to interpret it. Yeah. And... And then my antenna are, are up for those things that I'm sensitive to. Yes. And your antenna are up for those things that you're uh, sensitive yeah. to. And hopefully the fractal method does that. It it preserves everybody's identity, but it allows you to uh, uh, to identify how you see the world, and then make those marks, and then put it here, and then fill in uh, the information. To tell that story. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Shall we have a look if there are any any questions from the yeah. from the listeners? Um, let me see. Um, if someone is afraid of drawing in an actual sketchbook because you think uh, that uh, are are there any? I don't think there are any questions at this moment. Uh, I might I may miss them. If if there are any questions, uh, please. Uh, let me know. Then I'll I'll come back in a second. Uh, yeah. So yeah, there there is there is sketchbook fear though. There, yes. There is that where where people have a um, you know you get a sketchbook and it's and you open it up and it's beautiful you know white paper and and there's something really daunting about that and it, there is and I I think. That, <laughs> And I even have it on my lap right now. I usually have a clipboard on, you know, just around with loose sheets. And it really kind of frees things up. You don't feel the pressure of having to draw in a sketchbook. And you can buy, you know, really good bond paper to put inside the, uh, the clipboard if that's what you're looking for. Or uh, the uh, photocopy paper, you can put that inside your 8.5 by 11 if you don't want to draw in a sketchbook. But sometimes a sketchbook, the best thing to do is if, when you're starting out a sketchbook and you're not even sure where it's going, is don't start on the first page. There's something about that first page that is so daunting. Just go to the second page and fill the sketchbook. Uh, it's a lot easier to do that than to open up a sketchbook. And you know that, that there's so much pressure on that, what yeah. that first page <laughs> is going to be. And, and a lot of people, a lot of artists, really struggle with that. So sometimes it's best, like, look, just skip it. Just skip right yeah. through that. And I also think there's another thing that, um, and, and I know that I used to have this this belief, and, and it was an erroneous belief, but, but when you're drawing, that each every drawing that you do has to matter. 
every drawing has to be a masterpiece. Uh, and there's nothing worse for an artist to put that kind of pressure on themselves. Mm. Uh, it's sort of like, um, you know, you're going to draw something. And like, whew, you know, I, I might as well sign this now because this is going to be a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's sign it beforehand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whew, that was a nice, big, flashy signature because this is going to be worth a lot of money. <laughs> you, can't, you can't think like that. No. You know, you, you have to, you know, art is about experimentation art is about uh, you know sometimes it takes several times to say something right you know, think about that like you're going to write a poem do you just write the poem and, and then it's perfect and that's it you know maybe some people have that capacity or sometimes you write something you go back and forth and then you adjust things and, and, and then you put it away come back to it two weeks later a month later and you work on it again well art is the same way so the, the best thing to do is to allow that, uh, don't put that kind of pressure on yourselves and allow that process to just sort of happen. Don't think about your artwork as being each one being precious, but just think about it being uh, steps in a process that are taking you someplace. Mm. Um, as opposed to every, you know, sometimes artists start thinking of these things as being a, a, a destination. That this, is, that this piece that I'm gonna draw is a destination, as opposed to it simply just being a step in the process that it's going to take you decades um, in in the quest for this destination yeah yeah so you you're looking much more at the longer term than than at, at each individual drawing yeah. yeah yeah that's a good one let me see um are there any possibilities that you will teach an online class is a question by Gika Moomin yeah, you know, um, I had several offers, and Bobby Chu certainly has made that offer. And I, it, there was a time it looked like I was going to be able to uh, put something like that together. The my schedule is such now, probably not, probably not going to be teaching an online online class. But I may, I, I may do some small, uh, you know, independent lectures that will probably, uh, we probably will put up at some point. Oh, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me see. There's more. Uh, Daniel says, I'd love to hear more about the fractal method method, and how does he teach it? What is the methodology? Well, I think you, you, you spoke a lot about that already. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, Daniel, I would really uh, advise to, to have a look out for, for that book uh, when uh, lockdown is over. Uh, when lockdown is over. Uh, because that's a, a really helpful helpful book um, so I I see that we've been talking more than an hour already um, so um, I don't want to take up oh, too much yeah. of your time uh, the, the so went... absolutely yes um, so uh, let me please thank you for for being a part of this and and, and for sharing all that wisdom with us and it was great seeing you again it's been a while me too. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I, I love the fact that uh, when we got together in Seattle, that uh, we are two peas in a pod. That <laughs> when, uh, remember, we went to that one market, and the market had these little tiny sketchbooks. Uh, well, I'd say tiny, but they, you know, they, they were like, I guess, you know, like, uh, what was it, maybe 10 inches by maybe 6 inches or something like that, uh, 10 by 6 or, or something. Anyway. But we, we got little matching sketchbooks. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we thought to ourselves, like, hey, before, before our trip is over, which essentially just was a weekend, before yeah. this is over, let's fill it. Let's see if we can fill it. And then we proceeded to just yes. go from coffee shop to coffee shop, <laughs> to place, drawing in the hotel. And, and at every point, we finished eating, like, a, you know, dinner. We'd go out to dinner with friends. And, and then it was like, uh, do you want to... <laughs> and usually, usually, you know, because uh, I guess there's, and I have to admit, you know, there's an intensity uh, about uh, me that uh, that I'm on, I'm really on, and uh, and it was funny to to meet a kindred spirit like you because <laughs> whenever I wanted to, like, well, let's go draw. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <Let's vote. laughs> you know, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, so, I uh, I thought it was wonderful too. Yeah, yeah wonderful memory. <laughs> Absolutely. 
But I, I'm a huge fan of your work. I love some, oh, of, the, just some of the recent stuff that you've been doing. I mean, I, there's so much growth. Uh, and you started experimenting with painting uh, and, and really pushing yourself. And, and that's the thing is, I, I think sometimes people, uh, they overthink this thing of art. And, and what it has to be, it has to be coming from here. It has to, mm. you know, despite the fact that you can learn to do these things and, and you know, draw well or train well or, or use the fractal method to, to, uh, to spot design and things like that. But deep, when it gets down to the crux of it, it's got to come from something that you want to say and uh, yeah. the opportunity that you have. Now, now that you've taken your, you've learned your ABCs, you've learned your grammar, you've taken all the skill, and now we get to hear what it is that you want to say, and it's really beautiful. So I'm a huge fan of your Oh, work. thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. Well, um, thanks again. And um, right. uh, I, I, I don't know what, what else to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, good, good well, luck. We should do this again. We'll, like, we'll pick a topic or something like that. Or let's nice. say if uh, there are a bunch of questions that other people have. Cool. And uh, they're like, hey, you know, we can do a part two. And we can be. Uh, Great. You know, let's do it. Some other specifics. Okay. Cool. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure meeting yes. you again and chatting. And, and hopefully this was informative to whoever was uh, uh, going to be tuning in. I'm and, sure it was. Uh, I, will, I will see you soon. Talk to okay. you soon. Talk Take to care. you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.